Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. The process of learning new waters can really be as exciting as the catch itself. But still, the goal is to turn searching into catching. And we can benefit from every piece of information and technology that we can get our hands on. And like me, today's guest is a Florida transplant, drawn by the world-class fishing, but still having had to overcome a learning curve. Ryan Kostecki grew up fishing the Northeast for fish like migratory striped bass and bluefish. And while a move to South Florida meant a change in scenery, his calling as an angler led him to the sand just the same. Because Ryan Kostecki is a surf fisherman but a marketing specialist by trade. And while on a job assignment using drone technology, he saw the potential that this piece of equipment had in helping him learn new waters. Kostecki began using drones as an eye in the sky to observe fish behaviors and to survey water features and how the bait fish and the predators were responding to them. Just a valuable and creative source of data collection. And the use of drones is just representative of the progressive line of thinking that anglers are going to have to take to stay competitive in the growing popularity of the sport. And so Kostecki is using drones to locate fish, to locate features, and to deploy the bait themselves. And his success in using this kind of technology is evident through numerous shore-based caught jacks, tarpon and snook and so during this conversation we talk about the learning curve of piloting a drone and some tactics that an angler would need to be mindful of when flying drones for the purpose of fishing and we just talk about shore-based fishing in general and some unexpected finds in the sand this is an awesome angler with a unique angle and skill set this is ryan kostecki of chum slick advantage I don't know, man. I got a long bucket list, but I don't know how much of it I'll be able to get done. But this, this well, the a- next, yeah, the next trip that um, me and my girlfriend were taking, she's like, you know, w- would it be okay if you didn't bring a fishing rod on the trip? And I'm like, and she fishes with me all the time, right? So yeah. like, she's like, maybe we could probably just do this. And I'm like, absolutely, like M- Mayan ruins. Here we come, you know. Like, I, I'd be all about that. You yeah, know? that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, but it, I mean, maybe for like the first day or two. I'd go somewhere that does not <laughs> yeah. have water. Because you know yeah. damn well, if you get out there with no rods, you're about to see like some stuff you've never seen before. Yeah. No, You know, to- when you're traveling like that, it, it, it can be a challenge. You know, like w- when I first came down to Florida, uh, I didn't touch a fishing rod for like eight months. Eight months. And I was like, because because I was like, I didn't, I didn't know you know, anything about anything down here. And I was like, you know, how do I want to tackle this? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, so it was like, I I didn't know anybody or, you know, like I didn't know even where to go because uh, in this, in this stretch of Palm beach County, you know, there's really not much um, content out there uh, about like beach fishing. There, there really isn't. You know, yeah, you go to the inlets and you do your thing there. But, you know, outside of that, and you're, you're, you're on your own there. Yeah. And yeah, it's I like, I that. just, well, I, I, I like wasn't ready to make the full commitment. <laughs> well, ironically, when I, when, when I first moved to Florida, which was going on six years ago, uh, the first week I was here, I was still in Airbnbs. My family hadn't even moved. We come, come, came over from Arkansas. It's not where I'm originally okay. from, but we just, that's we where my girlfriend's from. Yeah. Oh, Arkansas. That's cool. Yeah. Little oh, Rock. We, we moved. Um, okay, yeah. My my brother lives in Little Rock. We lived in the Northwest, you know, up in the Ozarks. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's not where I'm originally from. It got old for me. It got old fast. 
it's a nice place. It did. But, but the first week I moved down here, I was still bouncing around from Airbnb to Airbnb, and uh, like 90% of my fishing gear got stolen out of the back of my Jeep. So I was like, oh, no. I like I had yeah. left the back hatch door. I guess I did, it wasn't fully closed, so it's, it's on me. So I'm, but, um, yeah, all my land-based shark fishing gear, gone. Like, everything that I really wanted was gone. Like, my big game, like, everything. Like, thousands of dollars in gear. Yeah. Gone. And, uh, but, anyway. Well, let's dive into this thing, because, cool, you man. know, I want to get into the, the juicy stuff, because the stuff that you do has been really interesting and fascinating to me for a long time, but it's like, I didn't really find anybody who could, like, be the guy to 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 lay it on me but we sort of met through a mutual contact that being david rock and like like you just alluded to you kind of moved down here and i want to know from where sort of maybe the fishing you were doing prior to coming to florida because i didn't even know that i didn't know if you were florida born and raised or what but uh your your connection to david on the surf um how did y'all get linked up how'd you come across that guy um so i, I guess like you know, again, through a mutual friend, hmm. uh, and you, you might know, uh, Joe that, that kind of, you know, made the introduction, but, um, so I, I, I originally, uh, came down here from, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I, I hmm. grew up and, and, uh, spent a lot of time, uh, in a town called Mashpee, which is on the Cape. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in Dennis and then, a lot of time really on the Eastern seaboard of Massachusetts, uh, or close to. So I was like through and through, uh, a surf fisherman. Yeah. Um, and like, man, talking about like fishing with some of the greats there alongside guys like Tony Stetsko, who, who had, you know, at one point was the world record, uh, straight bass. Um, so like he ran or, or him and his father ran a tackle shop in Orleans that was like, that was our spot to go to. It was called the bait shack and, um, just, you know, amazing, amazing, uh, times, amazing memories there. And just a lot of, um, you know, a lot of alone time on the beach, really, uh, especially in the fall. Dude, that is funny. I didn't know that. Um, I'd yeah. seen a couple of your photos of like some big bluefish and stuff. So I think I'd gathered you'd at least spent time up there. That is a culture of fishing and a culture of fishermen, like characters. It's really like become a an interest of mine, like within the last like two years. That like that I don't know, that northeastern sort of surf scene. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's just funny, like these guys ascend to these like legendary status and like I, I don't know of anywhere else in the country that that exists it's like oh that's salty bob and that's you know so and so i'm like oh that is so funny yeah. like there's like this rank structure of like the old like dogs up there but that's funny so that's man that it's it, it, it is a crazy place to go because like at one part of the year the place is absolutely dead and you're absolutely lucky if you can get a chance at like maybe some like holdover trout, you know, on, in the freshwater scene down there. And yeah. then when, uh, like the end of April happens, it's like people just come right out of the woodwork and old relationships are like rekindled on the spot. And all of a sudden, like you're in this community before you even realize it. And if you spend a few years down there, a few full seasons down there, you can get plugged in really quick. And, you know, a, a lot of it, I guess, so I, I went to school at, at UMass Dartmouth uh, m almost a millennia ago, it feels like. Um, so I spent a lot of time southeastern Massachusetts and yeah. uh, in the, in the Rhode Island, the northern Rhode Island shoreline. So like fishing places like Charleston Breachway, the West Wall, catching like that very first striper that comes up. And, it, you know, it's funny because like <laughs> you, you'll hear rumors like, well, it had light. It had lice on it, so you know they're coming up here. It, it wasn't a holdover because you know there is a population of anglers up there too that will just fish holdover stripers in in the marshes and stuff. So uh, crazy, crazy place. And I, I go up there, you know, a couple times a year, and I mean the fisheries changed up there for sure. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I gather. I, I do. I've listened to a few. I'm actually. I'm kind of like, you know. 
I'm scouting right now. I want to find a good solid character from up there because that, like I said, that culture of fishing is interesting to me. Like the characters, I don't know if it's like inadvertently so entertaining too, like to listen to them talk. But it's like there's like this abrasiveness to those guys. I'm like, oh man, it's like do people like really share space on the sand like amicably, or is like uh, you got to earn your rights to be on this turf? I'm like, what is going on with these dudes? You know, I I, I think I think. Um... <laughs> The answer to that's no sharing is not caring up there yeah <laughs> and like it, you're cool if you go to the spot with another person yeah you know or or if you're solo and you happen upon you know uh, uh, another individual and you know like back back in the days of of when guys like tony stetsko were out there i mean the, the guy's a beast he like he would just fish alone and Mm -hmm. It would be like the end of October. Uh, no one else even within miles and you're just fishing this beach. And then all of a sudden you're right next to, you know, like fishing right next to legend status. And you're just like, I should probably put the rod down and start taking and watch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just, um, you know, it kind of gives me a little bit of goosebumps just thinking about it. Cause you know, um, even to this day, he's still, you know, obviously he's passed on, but he still has a huge presence and you can feel his presence out there when you, when you're fishing. So it's, it's really some good stuff. Well, that's good. Now that's like, to me, that's a difference between a good angler and a great angler. You meet these people. Like if you can put your ego aside and like, accept the fact that you can learn something from another person, yeah. man, you're like, you're on the way to getting better. I, I don't know, dude. If I don't know if you're like, you know, I, I fish with, I don't fish with a lot of people, but it's like, you know, you you definitely come across people every now and then that like they have no intention of learning anything and like being the student right like, man dude your your ceiling is low like you you need to get out of your own way and accept that you don't know like you, you don't know everything but that's that's cool and it's funny it's funny that you mentioned that because like m me and my little brother adam we spent like you know on the bikes and when we got our first cars and we would just go from bait shop to bait shop. Right. And trying to find out like where the bite is, you know, yeah. like w where it's happening. And we try to get the Intel from the tackle shops and it's like, you go in there and it's like, they're speaking another language to you, yeah. <laughs> you know? And you're kind of just like, what, 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 he didn't really tell me anything. He didn't say anything. And so like all these years later and, and you figure out like, they didn't say anything because they don't know anything. They're in the tackle shop. They're yeah. not making casts. They're not making casts. So for, from a very young age, it was like, we have to go out and create this bite on our own, mm -hmm. you know? And then um, when you talk about like uh, surf fishing in the Northeast, especially during the summer, like that's exactly what you do. You, you, you get your high percentage areas uh, and you say like, high percentage tides and you say like, okay, the fish, there's, there's a really good chance they're going to be here. And if you see them and if you can tell that they're there, you can buy certain techniques and certain, certain plugs and, and certain, uh, retrieves, you can create this bite around you with a couple of anglers right next to you where you excite the whole pile of fish yeah. and they're just going nuts on you every cast. Whereas like three minutes ago, before you got there, it looked like a desert. So it was, you know, you, you couldn't tell there was anything there. Yeah. I like that you describe. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like it, that, that experience of like hopping on the bike and like having a yeah. real childhood. <laughs> some of us have the fortune of being able to say we had that. But, uh, you know, it's like you're describing a learning process that's much more tribal and much more yeah. like learned uh and like boots on the ground than maybe what you see today and, and you did mention something about like the scene is changing what do you think was like the catalyst for the change i mean is it probably because nowadays you can get on your smartphone and see the background of somebody's photos and like ah yeah no. i mean but. i i think what changed it was th there was a an absolute slaughter at the cape cod canal uh, like 2016, 17, and 18. And so it, slaughter, not, not, in a, not in a negative way, but they murdered, they, they, they caught a ton of fish, all big fish. And, okay. and, 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 you know, I can't really speak to like 
the ethics of of what was you know going on there but i think that opened the door to a lot of different anglers to go down there and catch monster fish with absolutely no knowledge with absolutely no know-how and they got spoiled real quick so like so they went me, down there and when you say slaughtered they like what they were taking out big spawners something like no, that just, I mean, they were just they're... catching a lot of fish not treating them correctly uh, uh and then and and not just a lot of fish massive fish on on just about anything you threw in the water because for whatever reason uh those years i guess it was a very very large uh class of fish that had matured or that had been maturing yeah and man it was a all it really takes is a couple of really good bites to happen at a spot like the canal before people start hearing about it and then you have tons of people coming from jersey new york rhode island maine new Hampshire, like everywhere so again with like creating the bite you have all those people down there obviously you're going to get more reports of fish being caught just because you know one you're fishing in a, you know one of the best places on the eastern seaboard mm -hmm. but um you know for for that particular spot i i'm not really a big fan of it you know i spent probably you know 35 years down there and i could i i fished that place probably about seven times total yeah you know th there's something about uh a geographical bottleneck that the cape cod canal is that is kind of a turnoff for me it's a, it's mm -hmm. almost like um it doesn't take any any skill really now don't get me wrong there are some tremendous anglers that fish that place and that know you know pole 32 at this minus tide on this moon and they they catch yeah. huge bass it's but almost for, like a boca grand pass on my side of the state where it's like mm -hmm. bumper boats out there for a bunch of <laughs> piled yeah. on top of each other fish yeah. I mean, all in all, it's a great community there. But I think yeah. when I say that, you know, the fishery changed a little bit, that was like the biggest catalyst. It got a lot of people involved uh, into the sport, which is which is good. Um, but I think what was lost was, um, you know, some some knowledge and, and you know, the pursuit, because, yeah. you know, all you have to do is show up there uh, at dawn and you're going to get a, a 30, 40 pounder. Well, that type of fishing, I think, is really interesting. I've never experienced it. It's something I'd love to do, but it's like it's very interesting to me how like cyclical uh, the striper scene is, where like you mentioned the word class, where it's like you get these like schools that are like it is a class, like almost like a graduating class that you know it was they're the result of a good spawning group from some seasons past, where maybe whoever was fishing that class was responsible with them. So it's like, you can take these fish and hammer the hell out of them. And now what is it? Two years later, you're going to wonder where all the fish went, not realizing or ignorant to the fact that you yourself interfered with a spawning pattern or something. It's, it's weird to me, the cause and effect that those mass migrations like have. So. And I, I think when you, I think you bring up a good point about like, you know, manipulating certain uh, classes of fish and, when you talk about uh, manipulating them in a place like the, the Cape Cod Canal, which is like a the, the bottleneck, right? So, like th this is why the you know um, the herring situation got way mm -hmm. out of control there because like you're you're um, dipping herring uh, in a place where you know they have five feet. And they're on a spawning, uh, a migratory spawning route. Like, no kidding, you're going to have an impact to yeah, the species. And you're taking food out of the mouth point. of the fish that you want to, like, I don't know. That's, right. Yeah, and that, then there's that. Yeah. So, like, yeah. if you if you, if you're talking about that, you know, that quantity of people catching that number of fish out of a of, of an area, uh, a, a bottleneck like that, it's going to have an impact. And the good thing is, is, is what these guys have shown over the years is that, uh, by doing certain measures, um, like slot limits and things like that, you can manipulate uh, a species pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for example, like when I grew up, it was, um, 
if you caught a fish that was like 30, the limit was 36 inches. And if you caught a fish over 36 inches, you were like, you know, you, you were floating on that legend status, you know, yeah. because back then in the late, late eighties, early nineties, like there was no fish to be had, uh, especially in that, that class. So they got on it with that limit of 36. It came all the way down to 28 in subsequent years. And then, um, I mean, it's come back like we've never seen it. Like I I'm seeing things up there and fish up there that I've never seen before. And I'm like, man, you know, I, the year I moved down to Florida, uh, it goes absolutely bananas up there. But, um, I'll tell you the fishing down here is it's, it's totally different. Yeah. It's totally different. That's what I want to yeah. get into is kind of like some of the, the differences that you observed. And I like your Florida stuff's really what brought me in and, and what I saw, but I can't like, you know, it's, I, I, I want to touch on some of that Northeastern stuff. Now, the one that gets me up there, I wonder if you ever did this, like, you know, you're doing shore bay stuff or surf casting. The guys that like literally just like float in the water, like mm. they're just floating around. What do they call it? Skishing or something? Oh, uh, swishing. Yeah. Swim swishing. fishing. Yeah. yeah. See how stupid I am. I'm going to edit <laughs> that out. <laughs> now, That's for you... the New York guys, man. Don't even put me in that category. Okay. Okay. I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> yeah. Cause I know you can offend a guy up there. Like if they're a Boston guys don't like the Jersey guys, and these guys don't like those guys. Yeah. But, uh, that was when I'm like, Oh, that is like, I wonder how much of that is necessary and how much of that is like, I just want to like do something exciting. But, but anyway, okay. Well, it, mm. It's next level. It's next level. I, w I went to Montauk one time uh, for a buddy's wedding of mine. And I was like, you know, I, we have to stop to go, to go fishing. And of yeah. course we stop. And the whole tip is like blowing up with these massive schools of bass. And I'm like, these guys are out there. And I'm like, how did he get to that rock? And how does he have all his gear there? Like he must've spent <laughs> did he wait for low tide. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, that dude's swimming out there and he's getting bashed around. So, um, they took that mentality and moved it up through, I don't know how familiar you, you are with like Southeastern mass mm -hmm. and places like Westport, uh, gooseberry Island, um, the breachways, all that area is built the same way with rocks. So you have guys that are taking that mentality from Montauk and, and bringing it up North uh, okay. into Southeastern mass and, and even kind of no North shore, but the guys on Southeastern mass, like all of a sudden they just started absolutely crushing these monster bass. And it was like, okay, these guys are suited up something I never got into. Like I need to have my feet on the sand, uh, <laughs> to, to be able some, to like, yeah. Put on some of flamingo floaties on your arms and let the time I mean, take I'll tell you, you like <laughs> i'm the type of angler that if i see something and i know it works i'm gonna take it like to the next level so i'm kind of like fortunate in a way that i never got into that because you'd probably be talking to someone uh a ghost if you will right now because they do some risky stuff man dude it's it's one of those like fringe like niches of fishing that it's like it's almost more about the experience than it is about the actual fish like ice fishing is that way with me there's a lot of different kinds of fishing like i don't even care what i catch i just want to have done it but i don't know about that one that one's a little <laughs> like dude them dudes are that's wild yeah. stuff but 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 uh, you asked about uh how i met uh david yeah because i want to like segue into because obviously yeah you're you're a northeastern guy so then i you know it's like an obligatory storyline in your adventure or your experience as an angler yeah. like okay so how do you end up down here like the, what brought you down to florida uh well it was just a change of scenery like i i've wanted uh to live in florida where or, or a place where i could fish full time uh mm -hmm. year round uh and not be so like cooped up during uh you know like the winter time or the off season time you know uh i just wasn't i mean i just wasn't getting what i needed out of the sport uh up there on on like a on that limited seasonal basis so yeah, yeah. um you know the concern was like i've established you know a really good community up there i knew all the spots i could pretty much look at a calendar and say like, this is where I'm going on this date and on this tide and, and do really well. And I, and I got, you know, really into it. And, 
um, to take that to a place where I had no experience, didn't know anybody and, you know, didn't know any of the conditions or anything was like, you know, like I said, it took me, you know, six or seven months to even touch a fishing rod by the time I got down here. A lot of that, there was probably a little bit of ego in there too, going like, I'm such a big shot up there. Yeah. I <laughs> fish and I can catch all this. Like I, I come down here and I'm like, well, if I'm not going to be, you know, at the, at the top level of the sport, I don't even want to fish, you know? Mm -hmm. And then like, I started looking around, I started seeing, uh, you know, things being caught. And I started like going, saying to myself, all right, like who's catching them and what are they catching? And I'm just going to start at the top. So obviously if you take a second, you scroll on David's page, you're just like, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but, uh, let me go inquire here. And, um, you know, after signing a blanket NDA <laughs> with David, yeah. uh, like yeah. he, he eventually, uh, kind of like, you know, gave me a little bit of insight. And then, you know, I kind of used, a, I don't know, a strategy that I, that I, or I just live my life this way. It's more of like a reciprocity thing. So I always try to give, you know, before, you know, I receive. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was constantly inviting people out that were on, on that game, on that level, um, in inviting people out to, to fish or to experience a, a bite that I may have, you know, done well at down here. So, um, you know, and it takes time. That's, that's how you develop relationships. It's yeah. not just about, you know, seeing an image on an Instagram uh, post and then like, you know, all of a sudden you think you're going to DM the dude and, and you're going to be like fishing buddies and he's going to tell you everything he knows about the sport. Like it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Oh no. Especially anglers. We're more, I don't know. Uh, uh, I have probably been a little more open with people than I should have been. It's like, it's like, like I am very much coming from like wanting to share what I love with other people. It's, it's, it's hard to find the, the real ones, you know what I mean? The authentic ones nowadays, yeah. more, more so than ever before, especially if the place that you're finding them is social media, which oftentimes by nature is a game of like what you can get for yourself um, becomes even more hard than like, let's say if you just bump shoulders with a guy that you see physically on the beach and you yeah. strike up you know, organic conversation with a guy like that. But I, I, I kind of wonder like with your story is, you know, the, the affinity for being on the sand or being on, oh, your, yeah. on foot, like the surf fishing thing, you know, why not a kayak? Why not, uh, on a skiff? Why not on a, I don't know, you know, a bay boat. Uh, what is the allure behind, I don't know, the culture of the surf fishing that that's roped you in? Was that by necessity? Because, oh, man, I can't afford a boat. Or was that by uh, this, you know, what what is it about the surf? Well, chain? I mean, I, I guess that's I guess that's what you're left to uh, when you have nothing. OK, so um, take that statement for, for exactly what it is, because there have been times where you, all you have is a fishing rod and mm -hmm. all you have is your buddy to go out there and, and try to target, uh, you know, some world-class fish and, and there's nothing else. And, and, and you can put together memories with absolutely nothing. Uh, yeah. and that, and that, and that's really, really strong. You can't do that, uh, on a, on a boat. You can't do that, you know, when you're doing like, you know, crazy shark fishing with pen one thirties and stuff like that. Like it, 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 it's really where it started. And I guess that's where the affinity, um, uh, you know, is, but certainly like growing up, you know, down in that region or up in that region from here is, you know, I worked on the charter boats there, uh, with guys like Hap Farrell and, and Chucky Cataldo. Um, and they taught me, you know, what Cape Cod Bay is about in terms of, striped bass and, and bluefin tuna like those are mega guys out of the rock harbor fleet up there and you know i, I remember like when i first got um hired as a mate on there like i'm we're heading out and like literally i'm getting real emotional at this point because i'm like i'm they're gonna pay me for this 
Like I, it was like such a crazy uh, thing. And that kind of like introduced all these different anglers into my life and, and really kind of yeah. propelled it. But there was always an affinity uh, under certain times and certain th- conditions to get back to the beach. Yeah. That's cool. Cause that's, that's sort of what I had, what I'd wondered. I don't know. I, I get that way too. It's like, <clears throat> especially when your roots in something are, are that way. It's like, it doesn't matter where you go. Like if you reach like, I don't know, high levels of catching crazy international fish from these massive boats, something about, I, I know I get this way about certain types of fish or certain environments. Like for me, I, I guess the parallel here just in conversation is like, I get that way about for whatever reason, like a black water Cypress swamp. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but like when I can walk through and I don't care if it's loaded with mosquitoes, but there's something about black tannin stained water, Spanish moss and like Cypress knees that just like does it for me. I don't know if it's like the reflective yeah. quality of the black water and everything's like a giant mirror, but it's also like that type of environment shaped me as an angler. So it's like, Dude, I don't care if I go to like the tropics or up in the mountains. Like something about getting into the way, way back into a swamp does it. Is, is that where you? Is that where your kind of angling career started? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the southeast, and it was just like I think I started more as just like a kid that liked catching snakes and stuff. So I was like, I, yeah, I, I love the swamp, but but for sure, the overwhelming majority of my time, like developing as an angler, was spent in a canoe in a swamp or just wading through it. Yeah. So it's like when I get back to it, it just, it feels like a reset, you know, I don't know who knows. Some people don't care about that kind of stuff, but, but maybe that's probably similar to the, to the experience you have with the fishing. But, um, your learning curve is what's sort of interesting to me too. It's like, I don't understand the beach scene, but I do know that you've, you're doing something now. And I, if I leapfrog anything and like where you started to where you got to, here um just rewind it however you want but what i yeah. watch that you're doing is m- much more modern and very interesting to me it's like I, I've, I've been right on the edge of wanting to dabble in on myself is this drone fishing oh you, yeah using the drone for videography perp i don't really know what like how that started um but the use of a drone what did that start as? Was that for videography purposes, for finding bait pods, or or what? How did you get into that? Well, it was it was I was doing it um, a part of the marketing business, part of the Chum Slick Marketing Advantage uh, for a client that was doing uh, some uh, marine construction at a property that was uh, on the intercoastal, pretty pretty close to the ocean front, and you know. Uh, at this point, I'm I'm offshore fishing. I, I picked up like a a Grady White, a 20 foot Grady White, and you know, and I'm just I'm just being out there at this point. Like I'm I'm not really uh, into like the fishing that hard mm-hmm. yet, um, because I I really felt like I wanted to get like some some more knowledge and time on the water. So anyway, like I'm flying the drone for for this client and. Um, I decide to take like a loop out, um, a pass to the ocean, pass from the beach and then kind of back, uh, back to, to where I'm, where I'm stationed or whatever. So like I do that, it's eight 30 in the morning yeah. and <laughs> sure enough, like there's a pile of maybe 60 jacks just, I mean, and they're buzzing down the beach and I'm like, how, how is it that I just and saw this in the middle of the summer like what's going on these jacks approach this uh it looked like to be like a large bull shark in this formation where like like the lead jack is chasing this shark down and the, the other school is following it they, they probably think it's like a, a pot of bait or whatever the lead jack understands that it's a shark you can see it um on the video that's on my page there and he falls back in line all the way back to the end of the school and then the whole school ships away from the shark so i'm like i'm like huh. this this is crazy right because these fish these particular fish here that everyone considers like trash fish ridiculous fish these are the most like i, I would say like intelligent species in terms of how they're like communicating how they're 
uh, ambushing prey. And, and, you know, here's one thing that really tips you off that it's a, that's a, that it's a really sharp, uh, fish is that that's eye size, eye size compared to, uh, body length. I guess you could just do a, a simple equation like that. The bigger yeah. the eye, the more, the more things is, is going on with that particular fish. So at that point I was like, I didn't really see anybody fishing on the beach. And, um, and I was like, man, this, this area, no one's really fishing that there can't be really much, you know, caught. So that initially sparked it like, wait, there is stuff out here. And then I took it to a level. I was like, you know, if I'm going to take this on, I'm going to need all the tools I can get because there's just far too much shoreline. There's far too much stuff that I don't know that I'm, I'm going to have to take this on with some technology. Uh, and it was more than just like running into an angler on the beach and asking him like how he's catching it. Cause he's not yeah. catching any because like he doesn't, he doesn't really know. So I didn't realize the, um, the amount of uh, fish that were out there catchable until I put that drone up in the air. And I'll tell you the main area that I fly and I'm not, this isn't like a spot burn thing, but I fly from uh, Boca Inlet all the way uh, north to um, to Boynton Inlet. That's like that's like my my zone right there. Um, and so my goal was to know every single thing I could about every stretch of beach there. So there are certain points where I can fly right from my truck uh, and 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 probably do 500 meters in each direction, and I can identify uh, structure. I can identify um, you know, I can read the beach and then moreover, I can return in the morning at those same spots. So the, that, that got me thinking like, all right, you know, there, there's definitely fish here. So, um, you know, from there, it was just the drone fishing thing hadn't clicked yet. Um, it was just kind of like using the drone as a tool to locate right. fish in spots. That was like the first step. Uh, and then was just a ton of just grinding away in the middle of the summer for, for snook, um, was kind of like the thing. And then, you know, when I'm flying, I always would see these tarpon pretty much all the time throughout every single app, you know, all year long, you would see them all year long, um, more numbers in different times of the year than any. And I'm just like, you know, I don't know how I'm going to be able to catch these things, but I'm pretty sure that throwing a plastic artificial in front of their face, reeling it at, you know, at five cranks a, a, a second or whatever the case is, they're not going to go for that. And so, um, you know, I was just kind of like, do I want to take this on? How am I going to do this? So I was like, what if I just fly the baits out there? Traditionally, when you think about drone fishing, you see these people that are locating fish 90 degree, uh, and then they're dropping baits on those fish. That's yeah. what that's what people think about, like, oh, the drone fishing, that's what, like, people are like, well, how are you going to reel the fish in with the lure attached to the drone? And I'm just kind of, you yeah. know, and I'm like, it's a pretty good point because uh, you, you don't. But um, at first I was like, how am I going to do this? So initially the goal was like, all right, how am I going to attach this? you know, the line to the drone, uh, the drone's got a max, the drone I fly has got a max capacity of 500 grams. So I got to make sure that, you know, we're not like shark fishing with it. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a matter of like, for me, it was finding the areas in the afternoon and fishing those in the morning on the flip tide. And that's, that's how it started. And, you know, the first The first time we went out, me and my girlfriend, Andrea, we went out. It was um, Memorial Day weekend, May. That's May, right? Yeah. So it was Memorial Day weekend. And um, like there's some things that you learn pretty quick about drone fishing. You learn that, you know, boat traffic's going to mess you up pretty good. Uh, Wind is not your friend. Yeah. (laughs) And if there's any bit of weed you're just going to have a real, real challenging time, uh, making a good presentation. So, uh, it was like mill pond conditions. We go out, walk a mile down the beach and 
Uh, there is reef there, which we don't we don't traditionally fish around reef just because of the mm-hmm. shark scenario. But um, we were like, you know what? Let me just drop a couple baits down here. Uh, I learned the rigging technique um, on YouTube actually through Salt Strong. I don't know if you know those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they had a YouTube video of just a pretty simple uh, bait rig, and you know, I had some mullet in the freezer. Uh, flew it out there 200 meters, dropped it, uh, and nothing happened for the first like five hours. And it was just kind of like, all right, I mean, this is this is probably not something that we're going to continue to do. Mm-hmm. But then the this there was like a, a front that came through. Both rods go off at the same time, and I'm just like, you know, Andrea grabbed that one. I grabbed this one. Jet skis are coming, crossing right over the fishes, jumping everywhere. <laughs> and it was like, you know, from me screaming at the top of my lungs to a jet skier 500 or, or 300 meters out at this point, he's not going to hear me. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So the rest of that fight was in complete silence because, you know, Andrea's filming and I'm just kind of like, I can't believe this is happening. And, you know, we pull it in. It's, 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 you know, probably a, I obviously don't have a scale on a fish like that, but it's definitely over a hundred pounds and probably pushing 120 uh, on the tarpon. And that was my first drop, uh, first tarpon off the beach. Oh, nice. So at, that, dude, at that point, it was on. I, and yeah. I mean, it was. So, um, you know, it's a very specific thing because uh, you have to be committed to it. Um, and when I say committed to it, the, the real thing I mean is financially committed to it because mm-hmm. uh, we're on Falcon 7 right now. So uh, there have been six drones that are gone uh, yeah. that are okay. in the water, or they fall in the water or they break or, uh, you know, sometimes you can use them as parts. But I'll tell you, as soon as they touch salt water, it's over, man. That is what that was definitely one of the things I was going to bring up because I've been very interested in drones, if not like due in part to making like maybe a cool video, but also because like what you mentioned, having eyes in the sky is just, I mean, you can take one look at a drone in the air and look at it through the lens of an angler and say, boy, I bet you could, you know, see some, some fish through that thing. Like your mind goes straight to it. So I'm like, I see these guys with the drones. I'm like, well, that'd be so helpful to see like bait pods, to see water features, to see uh, uh, behavior patterns, like what you observed out of the jack. Like it gives you a very unique real time view. It's almost like, you know, cause I, I obsess over like Google maps. I yeah. probably wasted more yeah. hours of my time at work <laughs> playing on Google satellite images and always thinking like, oh, be sure it would be yeah. cool if I had a, a live feed and it almost offers you that. But uh, the thing that sort of, keeps me away from it it's like well i just i don't know how i would get past the 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 heartache or the heartbreak of one of those (laughs) seeing one of those things go down so like i'm wondering like your process of learning was there was there some like i'm like ah, you know you can only fail one time one thing has to go wrong for that thing to go down because i'm wondering like and you're attaching a string to it you know fishing line like, ha- have you had instances like where you'd miscalculated weights or you like you, you yeah. brought it down? I mean, I don't yeah. know, man. I mean, look, if if you're going to go the DJI route, get the care refresh package. That's all I that's all I would recommend. They give you two replacements. Yeah, you got to pay a little bit of a deductible, but uh, highly recommended if you're going to be flying uh, in and around water uh, for sure. Um, but the first thing too, that I did with my, with my drone was get a polarized, uh, filter for the lens. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Order, yeah. And you'll notice if for, for, for recon purposes, you'll notice that, uh, you can position the drone. You want to position it, you know, your ass into the sun, uh, and then you viewing at a 90 degree. Uh, or close to 90 degrees possible. That's going to give you your best visibility with the Polar Pro uh, filter on there. You can probably see in 30 feet of water, right down to the bottom, like it was, you know, two feet of water. But I mean, the conditions got to be okay too. Um, but that was a huge help. Uh, and then, you know, honestly, crashing a few drones, man. 
crashing a few drones and, and getting that out of your system and knowing the limitations of the equipment. To like the to like the novice guy who I don't know recklessly cannonballs into just buying one. What yeah. has like what hazards, both man made and natural, I guess should they be like aware of to like uh, you know avoid losing the money? I mean, I just you know when I mean, things- if you're just if you're just flying for recon, yeah, uh, you want to be careful with uh, wind. Wind, yeah. Uh, yeah, wind's been a. You want to be careful with understanding the distances because they're not always correct. Uh, sea level, actual sea level versus what you're reading on the screen. Mm-hmm. So, like, fly that drone in front of you, you know, and know what number is reporting on the device, and you make eye contact with it and say, "Okay, that's safe above the water," and it reads, you know, fifteen meters or whatever the case. You don't really want to go below 15 meters lower because, you know, you're going to be in the water. And uh, one of the biggest pitfalls is how that drone reacts to being over water. OK, it, it is it is calibrated to react very well over land, over hard structure. It can pick it up. It knows what to do with it. It can land automatically over water. It's like trying to land the drone on a mirror uh, and with the sensor. Like it's going to react all sorts of funny, you know, when it, it, unless you're, unless you kind of know what you're doing. Uh, I, did, um, I would not have thought about that. I was, I, was yeah. I guess wind is sort of the obvious hazard. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I mean, how much do you have to worry about animals that don't like the presence? Cause you know, you see these ones, I, I got buddies that have drones and they've told me stories of like hawks and stuff to, you know, oh, take yeah. it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, the ospreys, the ospreys, uh, especially, um, you know, around Gulf Stream, the ospreys that, you know, and you can pretty much you can tell what uh, areas are going to be, you know, habited by a lot of osprey, like the closer the building is uh, to the ocean. That's a really good sign that th- there's going to be some osprey there. The closer the trees are uh, not necessarily palm trees, but like the pine trees. And the the taller uh, trees, the closer they are to the water, the more you're going to have with osprey. But generally speaking, those drones are really, really uh, they're they're pretty resilient. Like I've had birds, you know, crash into it, and they they'll just move off to the side, and they'll keep they'll keep flying. Oh, okay. Um, you know, battery life is another kind of big thing where, like, you know, you're not paying attention to your battery life. And it'll tell you like return to home and it'll just fall out of the sky. And then, mm. you know, you're pretty much done at that point. But as far as like while fishing with it, uh, some things to be careful of is like your rod tip, you know, broken a few rods. Um, you know, when you're setting out, you want to make sure that the, there's you want to stand in a, in a certain position that the wind isn't blowing the line into the propellers. Uh, I've, a few drones have gone down because of that. Oh yeah. So you have to stand uh, on the windward side. You have to rig on the windward side of the of, of the rod as opposed to leeward because it, the line will flow right into the uh, right into the propellers. And you know we've we've had a few times where like the propellers get wrapped up in the braid. It doesn't hurt the drone, but if it touches the water, it's over. Yeah. Because that's the other thing I'm thinking, like the nature of the fishing is, I mean, salt water is just so hard on gear and electronics. Are there like preventative measures that you take to like, I don't know if you can like proof that kind of equipment or is there like a cleaning process to. There are, there there are, um, you know, I've got, I've got a couple spares and, you know, we have a lot of spare parts at, at the house. So. Uh, we know which pieces go, but as far as the drone itself con- is concerned, I use the the DJI Mavic uh, Air Two, uh, okay. and so the reason why I use this drone is because there it's one of their best selling drones. And what that means to me is that anytime something fails, I can go on Facebook Marketplace and buy drone only for three hundred and fifty bucks. You know, and so I always have. The, it's like kind of like what Eli Whitney, right? Interchangeable parts. So um, I always have a, a batteries from the same one. I have the, probably six or seven remote controls. It's the same model. I don't look to upgrade anything. This one handles all of the missions 
you know, just fine. So like, there's no need to get that bigger, better, faster drone. Yeah. Uh, and Cause I just find it's like, if you change, if you're changing platforms there, you're going to have a problem if, when something goes wrong. Not if something goes wrong, when something's going to go wrong. Uh, another thing is that that's really kind of foiled a couple of, of trips is um, the remotes have to click in, have to connect to a phone on the DJI Mavic too. So if they get any bit of moisture in there, you're done. You know, you're not going to have visibility. Yeah. Not to say that you can't fly and drop baits because you, there's a, we've kind of developed a manual practice where it's just as simple as like an elastic band uh, on the landing gear. And then, you know, once, once you reach your spot, you just hold the spool and the band slides off. That's like a little bit more risky. You don't want to really do that. Um, today we're, we're operating off of, uh, it's a, it's an aftermarket, uh, piece for the DJI. It's, it's like a, it's a piece of landing gear. Um, I guess I could probably show it to you here. Um, yeah, yeah it, this is just like, you know, China or whatever. Um, and it's just a, it's just a, co a collapsible piece of, of landing gear. Um, and it clips on, uh, to the drone clips on to the drone. I don't know if you can see it, but is that, it, it, is that magnetic? How is it clipping? Uh, it's just a tense, like a tension clip. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then you can just like pull it and it comes off. So it has like the back of it just fits right over the back of the drone. Pretty, pretty simply. And then it just, and then it just clips on. So this is like landing gear. If I want to do, uh, my manual, um, my manual sets, then I'm just hooking my elastic band onto the end of the landing gear and flying it out real slow and then just putting tension on it and it'll slide right off the wing. Okay. Gear. Yeah. Cause that was the big thing I was wondering when I, I've watched some videos where they like drop it and I'm like, how is it coming detached? I'm like, are they pulling it? Like, I hate the idea of like giving a yank, but I didn't know if there's like a battery powered thing that like opens like teeth. I'm like, what yeah, is so that's, the the, that's the manual way if when things go wrong. Um, so the electrical way, which we use probably most of the time, is on this landing gear, there is um, a little hook. Okay. And this hook is, it has a light sensor. Okay. Okay. So when this drone, this drone has landing gear, landing lights that I can engage from the remote. Okay. So when I, get, when I engage the light, the hook spins. So let me, I can just turn it on and you can see. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tapered hook. So the, the yeah. gear slides right off of it. When, when, and then you can stop it by, you know, shutting the light off. So, and then it spins and just, it slides right off of it. Uh, important about this when I, you know, and this landing gear is, I mean, really difficult to find because it's not really, it's not sold in the United States. Uh, it all comes from China, but um, important with this, when I was out drone fishing was line twist. Um, I encountered a lot of scenarios where I would just ruin spools of braid because of the, of the line twist. And that was predominantly because what I was using to rig the gear was like an additional piece on my line to hook onto the drone. So like whether it be just a loop that I uh, tied on the main line uh, or whether it was a three-way swivel that I added to it. Uh, and that was causing like a, a big problem. So um, this here, what I did was, and, and this is really like, I mean, it's something so simple, but it, it was, my goal was to have an inline, no attachment, no additional gear onto the line. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in, you know, true value fishing in, in Boca place is amazing. Great spot. Tony, there's the man. So I'm in there and I'm like, just, I don't know, looking for ideas. And um, I come across these 540 pound swivels with these, with these really big O-rings. And I'm like, man, that'll fit right on the hook. And I could just, I could just use it, you know, 
um, I could just use it for um, to hook right on the hook. Yeah. And so, like, I buy these swivels, and the guy's like, you know, what, what are you doing with that? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm tarpon fishing. He's like, you ain't gonna need 540 pounds. I'm like, sir, <laughs> step away from the drone fishing person. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, like, it worked out amazing. It worked out amazing. So it's it's as simple as um, you know, making sure your hook is positioned properly in the beginning. And then, um, you know, when, when the drone's in flight, you're hooking, uh, the gear onto the, onto the thing. And then when you engage the light, it just yeah. drops, no problem. So, um, that enabled me to position baits in places that, you know, I, I would never traditionally be able to fish. Uh, and, you know, I guess that really brings us to kind of like the next spot. I mean, it's one thing to go out and just drop baits out there and, 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 you know, catch fish, but you know, it's really not that easy. You know, uh, initially people think about drone fishing and think about like, all right, this guy's dropping baits on top of fish. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. The hours are put in, uh, doing the recon in the afternoon and then revisiting at the dawn tide, uh, in the morning. And so, um, we've been so successful, uh, with the tarpon, um, because of a few reasons, I really think we found something really, really special, uh, at, at, at a very specific time under very, very specific conditions. If you notice all of the tarpon that, that we've caught almost all probably 99%, it's flat calm. You know, these, these aren't conditions that you would traditionally think like to, you'd be catching fish. It's I've flat. seen that. Yeah, I've seen that in your videos, how it, like just glassy it looks. And Glass. I was like, yeah. that almost kind of stands in direct contrast. Like, like talking to David, like he's like, he loves when it's just horrible out there. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. So, huh. I, and, it, you know, I, I think that they they traditionally will bite better on our officials when when they can't see it. Um, but you know what, what I call it the portal, really, I, this port, like we created this portal and it kind of gives me chills because it's this moment in time, uh, in the morning under certain conditions when it's glass calm that, um, every bait, and this is going to sound a little crazy, but every bait that you fish, it's, you're on a multiplier of two. Okay. And here's why. So. The tarpon, right? They have eyes. They're like situated kind of on the top of their head, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know, more so than like a jack, the eyes are on the side of the head. So what happens is, uh, and I didn't realize this nice until we started taking like underwater uh, imagery of what was going on and, and release videos and stuff. And the calmer it is, that top of the water, it acts like a mirror. Okay. And we're fishing. You know, not very deep. I would probably be shocked if it was over 10 feet, out 200 meters. We're, we're really locating places that um, have no structure. We're locating places that are basically like a desert, okay, underwater. Because yeah. we, we, we really want that tarpon to come, and we really want him to see that particular bait. I don't want anything else in the water to cloud the issue in terms of reef, uh, in terms of vegetation, in terms of other structure, uh, I, I want my bait to be the only thing it sees. Okay. And so yeah. it's really important for us when we fish out there to have baits that are um, a lot of surface area and that are very flashy. Okay. Baits like big sand perch, they can be dead or alive because um, they're really flashy, silver. Um, and when they're laying on the bottom, uh, when the sun comes up, you know, a certain degrees above the horizon, mm -hmm. uh, those fish, they can see both directions. They can see the, the bottom off the reflection of the surface. Okay? okay. And they can also see the bait in their regular view. Yeah. So that's why I say we're fishing a multiplier because every bait, they can see it twice. That is cool. I would not have thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> and all of the bites that we get, 
are at a very specific time uh, in the morning. You know, granted, I've, I have caught fish in the afternoon under certain conditions, but the majority of these bites are happening, you know, a, an hour after sunset. The clearer yeah. the day, the better the fishery. Okay, that's interesting because I that's what I, one thing I was asking is like I wonder what the, like the ideal conditions are, but uh, yeah, so yeah, ideal condition would be like I, I would say if anyone's looking to take this this on, uh, I would I would say you know um, areas where you've got a fair you know a fair understanding of of tarpon and kind of how they how they interact their their migratory patterns. And where they winter, I guess it would be important. But uh, if you're looking for like productive areas, dude, I mean, empty areas, stuff, places that you wouldn't really consider uh, even going sometimes because you're yeah. like, there's, no, there's nothing there. But those areas, they use them up and down the coast. They use them as like a highway. Yeah, yeah. And they're always moving. And they're different fish that we catch, you know, um, very rarely, you know, will, will it be the same fish? Cause we, we, we photograph all of them and we've got a pretty good understanding of like the unique characteristics, uh, of each fish. So you'd be able to tell if you were catching a fish multiple times. Um, so condition wise, man, blank desert, no structure. Uh, the more structure I fish near, the more problems I have with sharks. So, uh, yeah, you know, I want to, st I want to stay away from the shark species, um, just for this particular bite. Um, and then, you know, bait wise, I'm not looking to make a big scent trail. I'm not looking to, to put a lot of scent in the water. I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on how the bait looks. So okay. now I've yeah. seen, I've seen some of these drones like on the market that are, they look like they're even designed to land on the water or they're like designed for being near water. I'm so I like wonder like what, you know, I would think that anybody who's just getting into it may stumble upon that and assume all, oh, you know, this is the route to go. But so then I wonder like, well, why have you gravitated? Away? You've got to know which ones I'm talking about. They're like orange or they're like red or something like that. Yep. Uh, those, I mean, certainly good drones, certainly uh, they're, they're very stable. Uh, drones, um, for that price, you could probably buy like three or four of the Mavericks on the mark on Facebook marketplace. Oh, wow. Okay. So oh. like if, if you spend, you know, 2,500 or 3000 for a drone like that, and when that thing goes down or, or when something goes wrong with that, you're, you're done, man. Mm. And you took a, you just took a big hit. Uh, if, if you, if it's, if it's done right. And, and you're on Facebook Marketplace, you're not buying the best drone out there, okay? Because all I needed to do is carry a 12-ounce bait out 200 meters. I don't need any of the frills or release clips or anything like that. I need it for one purpose, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so my suggestion would be, you know, try it with a lesser drone first. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. be prepared to, to, to lose a few. If you really, really want to dedicate yourself to that fit and you want to be good at it, yeah, man, you got to feel how it feels to crash one of these puppies. I don't know if there's an opportunity. Well, surely there is, but I mean, I guess surely you maybe urge somebody. A smart person, their first flight ever probably isn't going to be at the beach. They're going to go to like a park or something <laughs> to practice. But um, I guess maybe this is an apples to oranges kind of comparison. Um, but you know, it's like, it's in the back of my mind, but you also see these, I don't know if you call it a drone, but there's like these bait deploy deployment boats. They're like these like, uh, remote controlled boats that, uh, and I don't mean like the carp style ones where it like goes out and dumps a pile of corn. I've seen these like wild looking ones that like, can they like fly across the water? I've seen them like drive through giant tidal waves and roll over and keep going. Um, uh, you know, it, is there like, I don't, again, like what advantage would a drone have over that? Or is it really just like, you know, you're kind of comparing two different applications all together. You know, I think one of them is called an aqua cat or something like that. I, anything that can get your bait out there, uh, is, is going to put you in a good spot. Um, I, I don't know so much that I like, um, uh, Technology like that, you're going to run into, you may run into problems in weather 
you're going to run into problems if there's a little bit of weed out there that you're not seeing. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you know, just the less commotion going on in the water is kind of, you just kind of want to stay with that. You know, and then you really you don't have the advantage of the top down if you want to look around. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't see anything. I guess that's the kind of the glaring advantage that the drone will always have. Always, I, yeah. I, I see those things and I don't really know how they run it out. But, I, you know, I was, you know, your mind go, kind of goes there like you got this boat going across the top of the water. And I think in some cases they're even towing the bait out like, oh, yeah. so what are you going to do if like a fish? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if something would attack the boat or like knock it down. But uh. But yeah, I, I just because remember, we're fishing mill pond conditions dawn, you know, so like we don't really want much disturbance, in, you know, in the water. Not, you know, just because I don't know if they're that spooky, uh, but, you know, you, you just don't want that in the equation, you know. Um, and then what happens if you, I guess, lose it? I think they're probably more expensive than a drone. Yeah. Well, now, so this is like a type of fishing that I find deeply fascinating. And I think obviously the advantages that it gives you as an angler, especially as a solo angler. Oh, you know yeah. What I mean, um, it's it's, you know, it's you're adapting with times. It's a modern piece of equipment that I don't think you should have any shame in using. And maybe we can even touch on that side of things. But like you're using it and you went you went through the learning process and now you're sort of championing it. And I love what you're doing here because you 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 sort of like the lead blocker for somebody like me. I can pick your brains and maybe learn from some of the things that you've done. But do you have any involvement at, at this point now to go even a step further? Like you're using it, you're championing it, and now are like are you at all getting involved in like the products themselves as you know I don't know distributing I mean, or there there's there's a. Um... You know, there, there's a pathway uh, for that. And I think, you know, being on the podcast today and, and you know, announcing we're going to announce a, a giveaway to at, at the end of the show. I think that's that can potentially pave the way for uh, for a pathway for for retail and products like that. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not um, you know, I've been in I've been in manufacturing and, and tackle manufacturer. I've worked for the distributors before. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's something I'm looking to tackle today, but uh, I guess what I'm out for really is to is to build relationships uh, with with good anglers, right? Yeah. That are looking to do good things. Uh, and you know, when you talk about that piece of technology, I caught a lot of slack, man, for the from the old timers that that fished in this uh, in this region. You know, yeah. they would always, I mean, and not like kiddingly either. They they're 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 telling me I'm cheating and they're, they're downplaying my skill level and all this stuff, which, you know, at this, at my age, like I could care less, but I'm like, you don't want to be cast in shade like that. Cause you're only cast in shade on yourself at that point. Um, but you know, people will be people. Well, you, you know, cause that was where I, I, I've got a, a buddy of mine, uh, this guy, Josh Dolan, um, he, he uses drones much more for like the videography side of things but it was very interesting because we spent some time over on your coast just flying it just out of interest and we just wanted to see what was down there yeah. but i was surprised like how angry like even regular beachgoers get like they they feel like you're looking at them you're mm -hmm. trying to spy on them it's, it seems like it's one of those things that is uh you know it's something new and it almost feels like an invasion of privacy when something's up there that has a, a camera. But I also know, you know, you get that way with any piece of new technology in the fishing industry where there's this initial reluctance to, to accept it. But then I, I immediately think, OK, but you're still a guy whose feet are on sand. And then you look offshore and see some of these rigs, these multi million dollar rigs with six 300 horse outboards they got crazy satellite gps the whole command center with these massive screens i mean you've got like like navy warship level technology at your dispense to go with this mass expansion of reach to get out there it's like okay well <laughs> who's cheating now you know what i mean like well no. wait, a, wait a minute like so it's that that was I was curious like maybe some of the pushback you had and what your rebuttal to somebody saying like oh that's not ethical or that's cheating. 
Look, look, Dave, like if if I was going to tackle the southeastern coast of Florida, I wasn't going to do it and, and by on foot by the beach. I, I, there's no way that I'm going to be able to get uh, to the level I want to be able to get to the for the time that I spend out there uh, just with my own two eyes. There's just no way there's, you, you're just. I don't, there's no one's got enough time. I mean, if I was 20 years old again and, and I didn't have full-time work and I could spend all this time. Yeah, maybe. But if you, if you, you know, there's just far too much coastline, there's far too much, uh, real estate, you know, um, it's very different because it's a straight beach, uh, all the way up. And if you look at places like the Northeast, the drones, uh, would be somewhat useful, but you can locate fish just by the geography of the the topography of the land. Mm-hmm. You know where the fish are going to be. You know, for the most part, here it's just not like that. There's just yeah, you've got your inlets, and that's a totally separate piece. But like, if you're looking to do that, the true surf, you know, true surf fishing uh, is from the beach. Uh, and if you're looking to focus on that, you, you you're going to need help. You know, and if you want to do it consistently, you're going to need some help. Yeah, I think about the little bit of time I've spent with a drone. And I guess like a, a similar parallel would be like uh, the the recent um, emergence of something like live scope, where it's like in, the immediate reaction is like, oh, no, this needs to be banished. This is terrible. And, uh, you know, that's a debate that. I don't know where I stand on, but I do know how I am and how I was with the drone. <laughs> you get the screen. And I became so fixated on the screen that was like, you'll spend, and maybe I, I know for me, if I spotted a fish, if I spotted one fish on that drone, I would yeah. probably become so fixated on working that one singular fish, I might miss everything else that's around me. Honestly, yeah. I feel like I'd probably do the same thing with live scope. It's like video game. I think I would become so infatuated with the moving blip on the screen that I would spend six hours <laughs> trying to get that blip to eat my blip when I could have just been actively fishing for six hours blindly and been more productive. So it's like, well, which one's truly more productive? You know what I mean? So it's, you know, yeah. I don't know. That's sort of my takeaway with it. It's, uh, but, you know. I, I'll tell you, though, like the drone fishing, though, like the real crux of it is the scouting and, and the, the miles you're putting in, uh, without any bait, without even a rod with you. That's really where the, the roots of the drone fishing are going to get you to a level where you're like, considering. Yeah. It's like a mode of data collection more than yeah. it actually playing a major part in putting the, you know, getting the fish to your hands. We've caught, we've caught tarpon like, not even not even flying the baits out there in, in some of these. I mean, you gotta you gotta walk out to your chest and cast it, but still very effective. The drone fishing piece came in knowing like at these hours, these fish are swimming through, not just occasionally, they're doing it every single day. Mm-hmm. Now, so like I, I I love the advantage that you have just having that set of eyes that's like you know, up there, and you mentioned earlier, you sort of alluded to to observing things you wouldn't have ordinarily been able to observe, especially when fish don't know they're being watched. Like, you get to really get, like, the raw cut of what's going on around you. But I also wonder, like, when you have this vantage point and you spend enough time on a beach that's tide-driven where things are brought in and dropped and things go back out, have you, like, seen anything? Like, I don't know, this is sort of an open-ended question, but, like, what what are some interesting things that you've seen or found either through the lens of the of the drone or just just walking as i know one thing that you found that i was like whoa i gotta ask about that but like you know it's like i mean i don't know if you found buried treasure quite yet but you know pretty close (laughs) but these associations uh that you wouldn't normally uh even think about one of the one of the major ones uh has to do with these turtles OK, and, you know, you, you start to understand that when these turtles are um, hatching, I mean, they're a huge, huge food source. Yeah. Uh, so, and 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 you'll see it for tarpon. So it's like all of a sudden now I've got this area where I'm like, OK, I'm not going to fly there. There's no turtle nest. 
right? So I'm, I'm canceling out sections of beach because of my regular visual. I don't need to put the drone up here because I know that this place is, a, is you know, there's nothing going on. But I come in contact because I ride the bike on the beach too. Another yeah. huge advantage. You come in contact with a section of beach and you're just looking at orange stakes everywhere. You should probably take a look because, you know, you're not the only one that knows there's turtles there. Uh, so like that's one, you know, we came across uh, just, I mean, this one wasn't really drone fishing. This is like, you know, probably three miles north of, of the cut there in Boynton and like during jack season. So it's worth the walk. And so uh, it's the first big push of sargassum uh, on the, on the ass end of the incoming tide. And so like, that's a pretty good spot to take a walk. So like I'm fishing down there and, you know, I get hit in the ankle by I'm like either a piece of wood or, you know, maybe like a palm frond or whatever. I yeah. look down, pick it up. And I'm like, sure enough, it's this black square. Uh, and I'm like, oh man, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Naturally in my mind, I'm like, you know, I wonder if there's cash in here. It's probably not, but probably a good chance that there might be some cash in here. Open it up. All of a sudden you can start smelling the chemicals and like I'm sitting on uh, a kilo of cocaine uh, three miles down on the beach. No one is around. Uh, and I'm just kind of like, oh, boy, like what am I going to do now? <laughs> you know, so uh, put it up on the beach. And I was like, I, I need to uh, I need to digest this for a little bit. Uh, you know, before, and then just, I just kept on fishing and, you know, <laughs> I've been in, I've been in recovery. I've been sober for, you know, seven years now. And, and, you know, of course those nasty thoughts are coming into your head, uh, of, of, you know, what to do and, and kind of like how much fun you can have. And of course, Andrea is leaving for 10 days on a trip to see her father. Uh, so I'm like, I mean, this is the perfect setting, you know, <laughs> So, you know, after about 45 minutes, I did call, I called uh, an old timer fish, fisherman friend of mine. And I'm like, I, I felt like I had, a, I needed to tell somebody uh, just to kind of uh, hold myself a little bit more accountable. Uh, and then, you know, I called, I called the authorities. They didn't seem like it was a big deal. I said, just get it out of here and uh, went on with my business. So um, there was a, there was a big force to like not contribute to, um, the negative, I guess. Right. I mean, yeah, anyone, everyone says, Oh, if I find that I could sell it for this and that. And mm -hmm. I guess what a lot of people don't understand is, is what comes along with that, you know, and, uh, the negative that you're putting out there. Yeah. Uh, by, so. What a strange, you know, I don't know how, like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if spiritual is the word, but like a, what a interesting way that like forces of nature that might've been behind that to like lure you into a temptation of sorts. But, yeah. um, especially when you're on like, you know, you're on a different path fishing, which is like, you know, it's, it's, it couldn't be more pure. It couldn't be better for, for, for the spirit, but to have that thrown in front of you. But I don't know, dude, I like, if I think if I saw that, I would be so afraid, like, that I'm like being watched, you know, mm. it's, it's such a, such a, but you know, it's just crazy because you hear the stories of people who find that stuff. Like, you know, you read about, you hear about it. But, uh, when I saw, I saw that when I was scrolling your page, I'm like, no freaking way. Yeah. It was nuts, man. And I'll tell you, like, um, I do the right thing and right things happen. You know, I went on an absolute tear after that, after that event. And, you know, I had two fish, two jacks over 40 pounds. And then, I mean, this season for tarpon fishing has been just, you know, incredible. Probably uh, me, me and the team probably were 15, probably 15 or 16 tarpon to the beach when no one's even hooking them in Palm Beach County. Aside, yeah. you know, of course, if you're going to, you know, PBI Inlet and you're fishing shrimp, on this day, you're going to hook into 40, 60. I'm talking about the three digit ones from the sand. Yeah. You know, those, those are among the hardest ones, I think, to uh, to hold fish and catch. I mean, it's, 
can be a challenge. So like after that moment, like you, you do, you see, like I could have done this, taken this brick, put it up my nose for the next 10 days, had probably a pretty good time, you know, and when you think about it, or you do the right thing. And so like, you almost see it as like a, uh, I don't know, a crop, you know, you, a, a fork in the road is what they say. Yeah. And I definitely saw that, you know, and I definitely had the options and I had 45 minutes with myself with that sitting up on the beach, uh, smelling all sorts of good, uh, <laughs> at the moment. And, you know, it was just kind of like that, that's not the trajectory that, that I'm on at this point in time. And sure. I mean, a lot of people hit me up going, you are an idiot. You know, you could have got this for that, or I could have done this with that. And I'm like, please, man. What uh, now that I've geez, you talk about moronic advice from anybody. That that's pretty telling and sad. But um <laughs> you think just I just oh, I don't understand that. You think of what the tide routinely brings in. Oh, it yeah. just it sounds like one of those things that would be like a one in a bazillion, like you know, uh, once a, you, know, you just, but it's one of those things. It's like, it's crazy how prevalent that stuff has become and how much it's saturated our day-to-day -day life and, and poisoned the streets in a figurative and literal sense. But, uh, that it's that routine that people are stumbling across this stuff. So man, spend, wow. Myla, if, you, it, it, if you spend any amount of time on the beach, right. And you, and, and you know, you'll know because You'll you start to see helicopters and you think they're out just for a little sunset cruise. Mm -hmm. No, man, no, especially when they're out in low tide and low tide environments with heavy sargassum. Yeah, uh, it's what they're looking for. And and you, you just they're like crazy. And you're like, oh, wow. This, why is this guy flying it? You know, fit? he's going to take my drone down. <laughs> you know, no, they're out there for a very specific reason. Yeah. And then like later. Uh, geez, probably, you know, maybe 10 miles to the South, I'm fishing a spot and, um, a guy that runs the beach every day was like, yeah, I got one of those square, square groupers. And I'm like, did he just see my post or something? Or like, and this guy, I mean, I don't even know that he had a cell phone, but, and I was like, wait, are you serious? He's like, yeah, the cops are coming down there. So like in a matter of weeks, like, and this is just two. I mean, they find hundreds yeah. of the, uh, in the course of the season, plus the ones that, that, that don't go, uh, reported. So, you know, it, it's an issue and, you know, there are times that I think there it's more prevalent in than others for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy thing. It's a scary thing. Cause it's like the people that are packaging that aren't as stupid as folks might think either. Like a lot of those that are intentionally set into tide systems it's like those folks know exactly how the tides work they know exactly when it will arrive where it's supposed to arrive being carried by the natural flow of tides so it's like i don't know i feel like especially if you find a big enough one you you better believe somebody knows where it's supposed to be i don't yeah. know man it would scare me it would it would it would scare me but uh yeah single the single one is i think a lot less scary yeah. that probably I mean, got lost in transit somewhere so Later, two weeks later to the north, uh, they found like a hundred or 115 kilos that came up on the beach. Now that's something to be a little, a little, you know, scared of if you roll mm -hmm. up on something like that. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous amount of dough, yeah. but again, like, I mean, what are you going to do with that? And, you know, I'm like, I'm like thinking like, you know, I, I could use the money, you know, for sure. but. I'm not going to mess with it. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I'm just some dumb fisherman. I wouldn't even know where to take it to, <laughs> you know, the, the, my mind goes straight to thinking of all the kids that play on the beach and are like, you know, going to pick something up and like play with it on the sand cast. I was like, okay, well, you know, you gotta do something. But, uh, yeah, man, I, that was one I had to ask about. But, oh, and you uh, want to know what we found to say at the same spot, the very next day, a dead chihuahua. <laughs> oh geez not making it up man like literally within probably 10 yards of the same spot rolls up little uh little chihuahua on there and it was not you know it had it had recently expired put it that way like oh, it still geez. had eyes in it yeah still had eyes in it yeah. so uh kind of 
kind of strange. Yeah, you spend enough time at the water's edge, you're gonna find some bizarre things. Why can't it ever be like a briefcase full of straight cash? But I was Damn. thinking of because <laughs> if it's coke it's coke if it's cash it's going to be cash like you know yeah. it, it, you know yeah so, uh but no not not that day but i am super thankful on what it what uh came after was just like an absolute crush session when yeah. it came fishing so uh i don't obviously those probably two like don't seem to be connected but I'm telling you, like, had I done the wrong thing with that, I wouldn't have been fishing. I know that. Yeah. Well, man, I, I've stayed as disciplined as I could to, like, navigate through this awesome conversation without, like, leading <laughs> with the exciting product giveaway, you know, because I, everybody yeah. likes free stuff. You know what I mean? This passion that we have is not cheap. Yeah. Um, it can be expensive. Um. So you you had sort of alluded to that. You haven't even spoiled it to me. This is all new for me. So it's like I I, I want to know more about what you got in the works. Um, let me know a little bit about what you got going on. Uh, you know, it, it's in an effort to to expand the reach and to meet other uh, like like minded anglers uh, online on Instagram, uh, ideally. So um, you know, when you think giveaway, you kind of look at like a lot of different stuff, and you hear like you know people giving away, you know, fishing reels, rods and stuff. Um, you know, certainly good giveaways, but from my perspective, like, I don't, I don't think it's, it's not, it's not worth the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, so to speak. So I really was thinking a, a lot and kind of put it together. And, um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to give away, uh, via the Instagram page, uh, uh, chum slick, uh, advantage it's at chum underscore slick underscore advantage uh we're going to give a full drone fishing setup and it's going to be a giveaway that's going to last uh one month um and we'll, we'll probably kick it off uh the day that this this podcast airs and what it includes is uh the following so it's going to include uh a one dji mavic air 2 uh fully set up um the only thing it, minus the um, polarized lens. Okay, so it's also going to include um, a, the custom drop system, uh, fully functional. Uh, it's recharged by a simple. Um, it's an old USB port, uh, and you can recharge it. It's good for three hundred drops. Uh, it'll include uh, two batteries. Okay, so you, you recharge them. A full charger. Uh, full remote. It's basically a full drone fishing setup. Um, and I don't know where I put where I put the box here. But... And I'm going to send it out. It's going to come in the bag. And um, I mean, here it is, guys. This is a big, big deal. Mavic Jeez. Air Two. Oh yeah, it's a big deal, man. Bag and everything. Uh, drop mechanism included. And then like the real meat of this thing. I mean, seriously though is it's a custom rig man oh yeah <laughs> like forget the drone like how is he rigging that okay right. and it's, yep and, and that that's going to be included and it'll make a lot of sense as soon as you open it up yep so we're going to put this on the instagram page it's going to be in the form of just like a standard post uh and then pretty traditional stuff you know tag a bunch of people uh, I think the value there is enough to have you link it to your story uh, and share it to your story. Uh, in total, I would probably say, you know, obviously brand, it's a refurbished drone, uh, but brand new, you're probably on that, on the order of like a $1,500 set. Mm -hmm. uh, refurbished, I think on the marketplace, you could probably pick it up for maybe 800. So a uh, great way to get started. Um, and you know, I, I I love putting it out there on the podcast. I appreciate that, David. Well, dude, that was a surprise to me because that was a much more charitable uh, <laughs> idea than what I had in mind because we're not talking lures here or just some custom rigs. We're talking about something that's got massive value um, yeah. in a multitude of different applications and uses, whether it's for dropping a bait or just for you know, I don't know, having eyes in the sky, whether you're videoing your kids playing in a field or or using it for fishing which is what i would like to do but dude that is awesome i yeah. I, I i i uh 
selfishly wonder can the podcast host partake in this himself but uh you know <laughs> every man for himself yeah that is absolutely. awesome dude it's gonna be uh the instagram post is is up there uh and basically it's co- it just comment in the uh in the comment section of the post i'm in uh and then it's gonna be real simple where we just pick a, a, a random number generator and it's gonna tell us which uh you know, which number, um, and then we're going to find, you know, count the number, you know, count down the number of comments and wherever it lands, that's our winner. So that's the most impartial way, but you do have to, you know, tag two friends and post to your story. Okay. Because, you know, ultimately here, we're trying to grow the page. Yeah. Uh, if my goal is to get this puppy to like 10,000 through the giveaway, it's going to run for four weeks and then it's going to drop, you know, right uh, towards the, towards the middle of the, of the mullet season. So, um, yeah, don't get crazy on it though, man. You'll see a lot of stuff online about drone fishing, you know, trolling baits on the drone, trying to, you know, one of the most challenging things to do, which I haven't even really, you know, maybe you only tried it once or twice is try to like spot while you're dropping. You know, if you're, if you're trying to spot a fish and drop a bait on it, you better be really, really, uh, well-equipped uh, but also you have to be okay with losing a drone because that's a great way to do so. <laughs> yeah. I would start with the most basic approach for sure. And trolling a bait with one, especially with, we it all is. know how I, I've seen how those jacks can pull over there on your side. I mean, the things could just about pull down a helicopter, much less a drone, but, uh, yeah, it's, dude, <laughs> it's a good deal. It's, it's, it's opened a lot of doors. It's allowed me to to fish and, and to find this little portal where these tarpon, uh, will, will readily feed on just about any bait that's on the bottom for that period of time is like, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm really grateful to, to come in contact with something like that and to be able to, to be able to interact with those animals at that level, uh, at that size on, on, you know, almost on a daily basis is pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, dude. But Ryan, I appreciate getting you on here. Remind the people one more time where they'll be able to follow along with this giveaway, how they can see what you do. Um, just one more reminder. I'm obviously going to fill this stuff up on the screen and everything, but uh, Chum Slick Advantage, how do they find you on Instagram and anywhere else? Yeah. So, I mean, if you just search Chum Slick Advantage on Instagram, it's a big red star is uh, is the page. Uh but the the actual uh, tag is at chum it's at chum underscore slick underscore advantage, uh, and you know we're gonna have a post on there. Uh, you'll you'll know it very specifically uh, for the giveaway for the drone, uh, and it's just gonna be a factor of commenting on that post, sharing, uh, and tagging uh, two friends. So the po- the the uh, giveaway is gonna run. Uh, it's gonna take thirty days. Um, so when this podcast show airs, airs, uh, that's going to kick it off. And then, uh, 30 days after that is going to be the end date. And, um, we'll do a live random number generator, uh, on, on Instagram. And then, um, yeah, we also have my full support too. If, if you guys are looking to take this on, uh, or, or even have questions on the gear, um, you know, definitely. Yeah. Shoot me a DM. Always, always happy to help and expand the relationships here in, in Palm Beach County. For sure. That's awesome, dude. And, uh, man, appreciate getting you on here. I don't live too far away. Uh, maybe in the near future, I'll, I'll come over to your side of the state and I want to see this thing in action. <clears throat> Show me the ropes in person. Cause I'd love to see it. I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, I don't know, man, that's, I love trying new kinds of fishing and you've really tapped into something special here and you've piqued my interest. So I really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I love the podcast and, and looking forward to get out there with you. All right, dude. Well, you take it easy and we'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thanks, David. All right, man. Thank you for listening to Boundless Pursuit. Tune in each week as we bring stories and insight from uniquely talented anglers and outdoorsmen. And if you enjoyed this show, I want to hear from you. 
Be sure to leave a five-star review as this is going to drive the growth and exposure of this show. And if you have feedback or guest suggestions, I would love to hear from you. And you can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com. For all other collections of media and contact information, please visit www.boundless-pursuit.com.